Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we're on Topic 5, Lesson 3, where we're going to be talking about errors in null hypothesis significance testing. There's two basic types of errors you can make in null hypothesis significance testing, type 1 and type 2. Basically, if we look at testing a hypothesis, our null hypothesis can be either true or false. In other words, there is a random pattern or there's not. We can either accept the null hypothesis or reject it. So if the null hypothesis is true, that there's a random pattern, and we accept the null hypothesis, we haven't made an error. That's what we want to do. But if the null hypothesis is true, there's no pattern. And we reject it and say that a pattern does exist of some kind, that the research hypothesis has some support, we've got what we call a false positive. And we call that a type 1 error. And knowing the types of errors uh, is important. We'll get to that in a minute. It helps us to understand the potential problems with null hypothesis significance testing and how we can address those potential problems. But so a false positive is a type 1 error. That's when we reject a true null hypothesis. When we think that there is a pattern or we identify a pattern where there is none. Let's say that we have a false null hypothesis, that there's a pattern there. If we reject that, then that's fine. We should. The null hypothesis is false. We should reject it. If we accept it, then we have a false negative, where we're not seeing a pattern where we should be seeing one. That's another problem that we can address if we can identify it identify a type 2 error, there are things we can do to address that. I want to go back now. I just went through this quickly to get you back thinking in null hypothesis significance testing uh, train of thought or train of, of logic. The null hypothesis is true if nothing is happening, if there's no difference, if there's uh, no pattern, no relationship the null hypothesis is true. The research hypothesis is true if the hypothesized relationship or pattern is there. So we would expect what we want to have happen is to reject a false null hypothesis. Right? We want this. That would be when our research hypothesis actually has support. This is the situation when the research hypothesis does not have support, when the null hypothesis, no difference, no pattern, randomness, is true and we accept that that's true. Okay? So remember, this is where we want to be. We think of the idea of true and accept as being, those are good things. Remember, we're thinking in sort of a reverse logic in null hypothesis significance testing, in that what we want to see if we want to give support for our research hypothesis is we want to reject a false null hypothesis. We want to be here. What we want to avoid is a type 1 or 2 error that would cause us to make a mistake. Okay. Type 1 error, false positive. Here again, false positive, or when we reject a true null hypothesis, or when we find a relationship or a pattern or a difference where there really isn't one. That's a type 1 error. All right, so what can cause a type 1 error? And this is going to start bringing together everything we've learned so far. All right. One of the things that can cause a type 1 error is if you have systematic error in either measurement or instrumentation. Remember going back to when we talked about variables and error? If you have a systematic error, that your instrument is systematically moving 
the points in some direction or systematically measuring things wrong, you can establish a pattern where there is none because your systematic error is going to set up a pattern that would be unexpected otherwise. So a systematic error can create a type 1 error. That's why we're so concerned about those kinds of things. Can we correct a systematic error? Yes. If we know or can identify that there's a systematic problem with an instrument or a measurement of some kind and then we can correct for it, we potentially can correct for a type 1 error. Uh, this typically would require two variables to have systematic error, but if you've got a process where you've got really uh, dramatic systematic error, it can cause a, it alone a type 1 error. Okay. Another thing that can cause a type 1 error is if you have a non-random sample. The non-random sample could select a group of people who have characteristics that are really unusual in the population where the null hypothesis might uh, appear to be not there, where some pattern might appear to be present. And so we want to select a random sample so that we can tell in a true population whether something is present or not. One of the problems would be is if we select a snowball sample. That's one of the things that really can create a type 1 error because we will start with an individual. That individual may have very unique characteristics and those characteristics link to other individuals with the same characteristics and suddenly we find a pattern that isn't really generalizable to the population. It's, it's among those people but we, it's not really part of the whole population. So yeah, in that small part of the population, then we have a, a, a pattern, a relationship. But in terms of the general population, if we took a true random sample, it wouldn't be there. So a non-random sample, and again, particularly a snowball sample, can lead to a type 1 error. This, this uh, may seem a little counterintuitive, but a large sample size can cause a type 1 error. All right. Why is that? This comes down to an issue that's called power. We have not talked about power yet. We will talk a bit about it when we get into t-tests in the next topic. But basically, power is your ability to distinguish differences between groups. And I want to, you to think about this like a magnifying glass and sample size like the power of the magnifying glass. If you have two things that appear to be touching one another and you get a more and more powerful magnifying glass, what appears to be touching one another might actually be slightly different or even larger, show a larger difference as you get more and more and more and more and more power. That's what happens when you get bigger and bigger and bigger sample sizes. The bigger the sample size, the easier it is to see differences between groups and populations. Um, and that's because basically anything that differs, if you get a big enough sample size, you're going to be able to identify that difference. That's because you have too much power. Power is based on sample size and what's called effect size. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit. This really applies to t-tests in particular, which is the next topic. But a large sample size, you might not think that a large sample size could be a problem. It can be a problem. It can lead to a type 1 error. So what you really need to get is an appropriate sample size, an appropriate power. And again, we'll talk about that later. Finally, a cause of a type 1 error is if you have a very high critical p-value. All right, what does that mean? Um, if you say that it, I will reject the null hypothesis if something happens one time in 10, that would be a high p-value, that's starting to move into being so more likely by chance than you might want, and that's going to give you the opportunity to have a higher p-value. If you had the p-value at 0.5, in other words, it's a 50-50 chance, you have a 50-50 chance of having a type 1 error then. So the p-value, what you're looking at, it, the, 
and it's called the critical p-value. That's the critical value between which you accept or reject a null hypothesis. If that's too large, and in general, anything over 0.1 or 10% is not acceptable. If that's too large, you can create a type 1 error. All right, causes of a type 2 error then. And a type 2 error is, again, a false negative. It's accepting a false uh, null hypothesis. It's the failure to see a pattern where one is present. So it's opposite of type 1. Failure to see a pattern when one is present. What can cause that? Systematic error can cause a type 1 error. Random error causes a type 2 error. Why? Because basically what random error does is spread a distribution out. You might, if you think about a correlation with a bunch of points in a line, if you have random error, it spreads those points out. It puts points all over the place, and you end up having a blob that doesn't seem to have that pattern, where you underlying there's actually this nice linear association between two variables. If you have lots of random error, it spreads all that out. And you're going to get a potential of a type 2 error. It's going to look like there's no pattern when actually there is one. So random error is a problem. Another one is a non-random sample. Same thing as last time. In a non-random sample, what might happen is that there's a true pattern there, but because of however you've grab bagged or um, opportunistically sampled, you get just a bunch of people that sort of cancel each other out or cases that cancel each other out. It becomes almost like a form of random error and you can't see a true pattern that's there. This is particularly a problem, I think, in opportunistic samples because you're going to be looking at a very narrow range typically that are sort of unrelated, and so you get a lot of random error. A very small sample can cause a type 2 error because it has too little power. Again, let's look at, if we are trying to see if there's a gap between two objects. Well, if we can't zoom in on it enough to see anything, we have too little power, and that's based on the sample size. If the sample size is small, we don't have the power to really see. Again, if the sample size is too big, then a essentially meaningless difference of you know, some tiny little space, an atomic space, is going to look huge when, in fact, it's not meaningful, that, that uh, space, that difference. That's with a big sample size. The opposite is true with a small sample size. We don't have enough power. And so we accept a false null hypothesis. We fail to see a pattern when there is one. Again, this is most uh, visible in t-tests, which we do in the next topic. Finally, too low a critical p-value can cause a type 2 error because we are too stringent in our requirements to reject the null hypothesis. If we have a critical value of 0 0.001, maybe we're, we, aren't, we don't have the power to see that kind of a difference. And so we're always going to um, fail to see a pattern where there is one, fail to see a difference where there is one. So given these types of error, I want to think about how do we minimize that error. All right, well, one of them we've already talked about, reliable coding. If we can have a reliable coding where we don't have systematic error, and we don't have random error, that's going to mean that we're going to eliminate one way that we could get a type 1 or type 2 error. The second thing is that if we use a random sample, and I've said this before, random sampling is the only thing that can assure that your analysis is correct. And I think now you can see why. If you have a non-random sample, you can create systematic error, or you can create um, just general randomized error, and that's going to keep you from seeing patterns or going to potentially create false ones. The other one is an appropriate sample size. 
Not too big, so you get so much power. Not so small, you don't have enough power. And again, that's dependent on not only the sample size, but what's called the effect size. And if we think about looking at a difference, it's how big that difference actually begins being, how big a difference we're looking for is the effect size. So we can do something that's called a power analysis. It's very rarely done in anthropology for a variety of reasons, and we're not really going to cover it here. But we want to think about an appropriate sample size. And one way of doing that that I'll show you as we get into other topics where we're doing null hypothesis significance testing is to uh, take random samples within your other samples and see if the pattern you're seeing changes dramatically. And that's one way if you shrink the sample size down and you don't have a, a pattern then, it might mean that your sample size is too big. My opinion, minimum sample size is about 30 cases. And a good sample size is like 100 cases. There you're starting to get in a range that it's that that'll work. If you get over about a thousand cases maybe in social science research, depending again on the effect you're looking for, that starts getting kind of big. So Boaz's sample is really big and we're going to look at that. That might be causing an error. Finally, choosing an appropriate p-value. Not too big and not too small. Not so big that you're always rejecting the null hypothesis, not so small that you never are. And in social science research, the accepted p-value is 0 0.05 or five times in 100. That's sort of accepted as being the sweet spot between type 1 and a type 2 error. Other disciplines have other sweet spots, and uh, that depends on the phenomena and how well it and how reliably it's measured, how, with, with what accuracy and how reliably it can be measured. So in physics, for example, you're going to see critical values down to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, things like that where you have to have extreme uh, differences from potentially random error in order to get to say that there's a difference and massive sample sizes in order to get at that kind of level of detail. Anyway, in social sciences like anthropology, we're going to stick pretty much with a 0 0.05 p-value. That's sort of agreed to be, that's a good place. If we want to be more conservative, 0 0.01. If we have really terrible data that we think has lots of random error, we'll go up to 0 0.1, but that's the sort of range and 0 0.05 is sort of where we like to be. Okay, we're going to take a short break, come back and talk a little bit about experiments. See you in a minute. And we are back. We're going to move on now and talk about experiments. Uh, the reason I talk about experiments here is because null hypothesis significance testing is really set up for an experimental setting. And unfortunately in anthropology, we don't do experiments very often, at least not true experiments. So in an experiment, what you create is a scenario that's designed to test an hypothesis where you have two things. One, an independent variable. We've talked about this before an independent variable, which is typically in an experiment called a treatment variable, where you have a subject, you do something to them, something that varies from doing it a little to a lot. And then you have a dependent variable, one that is dependent upon the kind of treatment. And we typically call that the result. The dependent variable is the result of whatever happens with the independent variable. So the language example, the independent variable is the number of terms in a language. The dependent variable is the ability to see color. How might you do that as an experiment? You might have people from that speak different languages. 
go into a laboratory and look at color chips and ask when there is a division between say green and blue at what point and are there any colors in between and that's actually been done that would be and the independent variable language group the predicted result that would be the treatment how many language terms you've learned in your life and the result is you can see more or fewer colors so the hypothesis predicts the result based on the treatment the hypothesis predicts ability to see more colors based on the number of color terms you have in your language okay so in anthropology we typically do what are called natural or naturalistic experiments before we get to that I want to explain what a true experiment is and a true experiment a couple of forms simplest one is what I'll call a single sample where you have a group of people here happy me is representing a group of people who undergo a treatment and then there's an effect the null hypothesis is that happy me the happy me population or the happy me sample stays happy me the research hypothesis is that because of the treatment let's say it's being forced to eat huge amounts of candy a no, better one being forced to drink a lot of alcohol because that's bad being forced to drink lots and lots of alcohol the effect is to make sad me so this is a single sample group of people undergo a treatment forced to drink huge amounts of alcohol the effect sad me that's the predicted the hypothesized research effect but we might find a null hypothesis nothing happens and that would mean that our hypothesis is not right we reject it we move on to something else a two sample or what's called controlled experiment is really what is the 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 true the classic experimental setting and this is what you have there this is what's done in medical research typically is that you have one sample of happy me and then another sample of happy me so these are people that are that are of the same kind they're often called matched or paired uh, because they have the same characteristics they're all happy me's one group does not receive any treatment they just are left alone or in medical research they're given a placebo fake pill an injection of saline something the other sample of happy me gets the treatment the pill that kills bacteria or a, an, in, an injection that stops the flu or something and then there's effect um, in this case the effect research hypothesis would be that it makes sad me maybe that's the, you get rid of the flu um, which really should be happy me but um, the null hypothesis is that there's no change and here you have a really a, a much better kind of way to test a null hypothesis because what you can often have is confounding variables in your test and, and um, those variables can impact things in ways you don't understand so having one group that just you don't do anything to really lets you know if the treatment had no effect because if these people end up the same at the end that treatment didn't do anything you can be very confident that it didn't do anything if the treatment had an effect then you can also be confident yeah this this really did something so that's a classic experiment okay just talked about one sample and two samples and, and single sample experiments are a group of people some kind of treatment test the effect that's not the best way to do an experiment um, because you really can't see if there's other stuff going on those confounding variables that might be causing an effect and a classic one is 
a pretest post test in a classroom um, or across college experience whether you learn to write better or not because in a class you don't know what else is happening to people outside of the class um, you might be examining do students learn to write better from the day one of the class to the end of the class and you test them on the first day and say yeah they write okay here but oh they write great here well it might be that the students are taking a bunch of writing classes outside of your class and so what you're seeing in your class really doesn't matter it would be nice to have a control sample of people not taking writing courses and see if they actually change too so single sample has some problems but in anthropology often we deal with that we deal with a culture and that's sort of a single sample the, the classic experiment deals with dependent or paired or matched samples where you have groups of people that either are treated or not or that receive different kinds of treatments or that are somehow dependent on one another where one group is tied to another group in some way we don't usually do that this is in classic experiments you have these matched samples one is the control group one is the research group and and you test them this we don't do very much in anthropology what we do in anthropology a lot is what are called independent samples where we have samples that at the beginning we assume are drawn from different populations and the null hypothesis is that they're from the same population the research hypothesis is that they're from different populations and we'll be looking at that next time with a t-test because a t-test and then ANOVA is what we really use to examine independent samples okay what happens in anthropology is that we typically have natural experiments on a single sample or natural experiments on independent samples and a natural experiment on a single sample would look something like this we have a, a group of people happy me who live through some kind of life experience or are in a particular social context a given culture and by being in that culture we see or predict the effect all right the way to think about this is in terms of let's say someone gets initiated into some group or someone gets married we have a group of people they get married how does that affect them sad me no uh, they get uh, they get initiated through some pain ritual then they become sad me uh, how does that affect them the reason that this is a natural experiment is you're just observing the treatment is just a condition of life and as we go through some of the examples that I will be using to talk about t-tests and ANOVA and things like that you'll you'll be able to understand better what I mean by a natural experiment but basically in a natural experiment the treatment part is just some condition of life and some condition of culture some condition of the environment that people live in and this kind of experiment is often done with independent samples group of people in one culture group of people in another culture each that have different social contexts and then see what the effect is that's that's typically what we're looking at um, we're going to be very soon in fact in the next lesson we're going to go back to Boaz we always go back to Boaz and we're going to be looking at people born in the United States versus pe people who are immigrants to see if their craniums their cephalic index which we've talked about before stay stable or change that's really a natural experiment because the treatment is just a context of life we haven't done it to them we haven't controlled the treatment we just did they come here and get born here or not that's a natural experiment okay going through some of the problems you can have in null hypothesis significance testing in the next topic we're going to actually start doing some null hypothesis significance testing with t tests and z tests and then later ANOVA and other techniques so anyway 
we'll see you next time